Last week, the battle began, and already started going wrong. After a strong initial advance, the British reached Gabra Salur, their objective, and waited for the Germans to react. But Rommel didn't react, forcing the British to move in all directions, searching for their enemy. This led to the first battle of Bur el Gubi and the capture of Sidi Rezai airfield. But British forces were now diluted as the Germans begin to react. Will the British be able to pull their forces together in time? Will they be able to salvage their plan? And will Rommel actually do something? Well, he may not be doing much, but Kruvel is, as Kampfgruppe Stefan is about to strike. Notes and sources will be in the pinned comment, timestamps to various parts of the video will be in the description. The Germans of Kampfgruppe Stefan moved into the battle area with their anti-tank guns behind them. But then the 8th Hussars charged forwards and drove straight through the German formation which was sat in place. The British quickly turned about and swept back in again, getting to grips with the German tanks. At such short distances, their inferior 37mm guns were able to penetrate the German panzers. Any sense of order was soon lost as both sides became entwined with each other. Smoke and dust choked the battlefield. German anti-tank guns cooperated with the German tanks, but were unable to do much good because of the dust and the confusion. They also suffered losses from the British machine guns. One of the observers described the action. Inside that frantic jumble, tanks were dueling with tanks in running almost hand-to-hand -hand fights, firing nearly point-blank, twisting, dodging, sprinting and screaming treads and whining engines that rose to a shriek as they changed gear. As each new tank loomed up ahead, gunners were swinging the muzzles of their guns automatically, eyes strained behind their goggles, fighting through the smoke and dust to discriminate friend from foe. The fight continued throughout the afternoon, with neither side really in control of their forces. Later, 5th Battalion of the Royal Tank Regiment came in to join the battle from the south. But as the light began to fade an hour before sunset, the Germans withdrew. A support column had arrived to the rear, which allowed them to refuel and replenish their ammunition. German anti-tank guns now kept the British back, since they would be destroyed before their 37mm guns would be in range. British artillery was nowhere to be seen, and so the British couldn't interfere as their enemy replenished themselves. The battle continued again for a short while before sundown, but then both sides drew apart. 4th Armoured Brigade retired south, unable to take all their damaged tanks, leaving the battlefield to the Germans. And as soon as the British had left, German engineers came forward to recover their damaged panzers. Immobilised British tanks were destroyed to prevent their reuse. They both claimed victory, and both overestimated the number of hostile tanks destroyed. The first example of a persistent habit which would play havoc with operational planning on both sides for most of the campaign. Oberst Stefan claimed 24 M3 light tanks destroyed, and definitely 24 M3 light tanks were put out of action as a result of the battle. However, some of these M3s were recovered and were back in action within 24 hours. This meant that the British only actually lost 11 tanks. The British estimated between 19 and 26 Panzers were knocked out, but the Germans claimed that only two Panzer III's and one Panzer II destroyed, with another four damaged Panzer III's, all later recovered on the battlefield. The reality was more German tanks were destroyed, but these were quickly repaired, and thus didn't factor into the reports. So it's quite difficult to gauge just how many tanks the British did actually knock out versus repaired. Again, this is quite typical for the Germans in the Second World War. They're only interested in how many tanks they have ready to go, not how many have been damaged or knocked out, but then repaired. So the British had 24 tanks knocked out, then repaired a bunch, so only lost 11 overall. The Germans just tell us they lost 3 tanks. The British claim up to 26 Panzers were taken out, but the Germans only lost three. And interestingly, the, the Soviets are doing the same on the Eastern Front. They claim to be taking out more German tanks than the German statistics say they actually lost, which leads people to say that the Soviet statistics are untrustworthy. 
Well, you shouldn't dismiss them entirely since the reality was the German statistics don't show the full picture and downplay their own losses. It is almost impossible to deduce from the German records how many tanks were destroyed or damaged in a particular action. The number of fit tanks present with each of the Panzer regiments are known from day to day, but in the absence of figures for tanks which return to their units after being repaired, the losses cannot be deduced by subtraction. Occasionally, however, the German diaries record specific losses. Much the same is true of the British. The main point, though, was that both sides didn't know at the time who had done better in this clash. Both assumed they'd done very well, so morale wasn't affected, and the British tank crews thought they were equal to the Germans and were happy with the performance of their light tanks. However, their inflated kill claims during this clash would soon have a massive impact on the battle. Gatehouse read the reports that were coming in and was pleased with the performance of his 4th Armoured Brigade. He thought that the M3 light tanks were just as good as the German panzers and had inflicted as much damage on the Germans as his brigade had received. He thought that when fighting carried on the next day, they would destroy the Germans. By that point, he hoped that all of his brigade would have united and, with a combined strength of more than 100 tanks, smash the Germans. But this highlights the dilution of the British armoured force, as Pitt explains. The idea of a concentrated corps, whether at gabra Salur or City Rizai, seems to have disappeared from everyone's mind. And all of Cunningham's plans were now based on misconceptions. Norrie and Cunningham only heard of the action at Burr el Gubbi in the evening, when news came in that 22nd Armoured Brigade had charged the Italian positions and had lost 25 tanks. Yes, the Italians took out more British tanks than the Germans did on this day. They knew 7th Armoured Brigade had gone on and taken City Rizai, a position that put them in the middle of Axis forces in every direction except for the south and Cunningham knew about the tank clash involving Gatehouse's brigade and the German armoured camp group. But, despite the day going well in Cunningham's mind, 48 hours had passed and the decisive tank battle Cunningham had hoped for had not happened yet. This was probably a good thing, because British armour was not concentrated at this point. However, this meant that Crusader was off course and well, this left Cunningham with no real plan. The intelligence reports coming in remained vague, giving him no real suggestion of what to do, and he hesitated. His orders on the second evening of the battle reflected this hesitation. With little from the day's actions to go upon, and eager to reconcentrate two of his armoured brigades for the eventual armoured clash, Cunningham decided to exploit the limited success he'd seen in the north and concentrate his forces there. Gatehouse's 4th Armoured Brigade was ordered to return to gabra Salur and continue to protect the left flank of 13th Corps. Brink's 1st South African Division was ordered again to move close to Bur el Gubi. Armstrong's 5th South African Brigade, currently at Gerrit Hamza, was to move east around Bur el Gubi and reach the airfield to provide infantry support. And Pinar's 1st South African Brigade was ordered to take over the area 22nd Armoured Brigade was leaving behind and continue the attack against the Italians. Yes, one South African Infantry Brigade was now to go up against the Italian Arete Armoured Division. This was clearly blind optimism, and Pienaar objected strongly. He points out that his infantry wouldn't fare much better than an armoured brigade did against the Italians. Cunningham therefore modified the orders so that Pienaar only needed to mask the Italian positions rather than take them. Either way, Scott Coburn's 22nd Armoured Brigade was ordered to wait for relief by the South Africans, then disengage the Italians, and then move north of Bur el Gubbi to reinforce Davies' 7th Armoured Brigade. 7th Armoured Brigade was ordered to scout further north, and Campbell's 7th Support Group was to join Davies' Brigade at City Rizai. It seems that Cunningham wanted to concentrate most of his armour at City Rizai, probably influenced by Norrie, who wanted to have the armour meet there on day one. 
He also ordered that Davy should take point 175 as soon as possible, since this was the dominant feature in the area. Speaking of Nori, during the night, Gott moved his HQ to the escarpment, which was very close to the front line. There, he realised that the Axis front ahead was weak, and told Nori that he might be able to push his support group through and make contact with Scobie's division in Tobruk. Nori, who was always much influenced by Gott, found the idea appealing, although it did run counter to the agreed plan of defeating the enemy armour as a priority. Unfortunately, overnight, the wireless systems in 8th Army decided to break down. Cunningham was unable to receive or give orders, and was effectively blinded. Therefore, he decided to fly back to his HQ in the morning. When he left Nori, he had still not been able to give him free control of 4th Armoured Brigade, his principal reason for travelling with him at all. This meant Cunningham was leaving Nori in command of just two armoured brigades, and had left him at a time when Rommel was about to strike. Rommel still wanted to concentrate on Tobruk, with the deadline for the start of the attack set for the next day. Rommel thought that Sumerman's Africa Division could handle the fighting at Sidi Rezai, and he thought that the Arete could also handle the situation at Bir el Gubi. But Rommel had finally decided to react, since it now seemed that the British were trying to prevent his attack on Tobruk from happening, or even to raise the siege. So he gave Kruvel a free hand in deploying both Panzer divisions to destroy the British before they could make a serious attempt to relieve Tobruk. It appears as though Kruvel hadn't seen the intelligence reports which said the wings of 7th Armoured Division were at Bir el Gubi and Gabra Salur. But he did know from the reconnaissance reports from the previous day that British tanks were at Sidi Azais and above Bardia. He therefore decided that the Bardia area was the main focus of the British attack, not Tobruk. So Kruvel chose to tackle the force that had moved towards Sidi Azais, which was 4th Armoured Brigade. He ordered 15th Panzer Division to move east, and 21st Panzer Division to move for Sidi Omar, picking up Kampfgruppe Stefan on the way. With the frontier garrison in the east, this would prevent the enemy force from escaping southwards. It was going to be a perfect German encirclement battle, the type Kruvel was used to fighting. And of course, rather than engage in a mass tank battle as the British had hoped, Kruvel was planning to annihilate each of the British armoured formations in isolation, further foiling the British plan. November 20th was surely the day upon which tactical command on the desert battlefield on both sides was at its nadir. At the beginning of the day, 7th Armoured Brigade and 7th Support Group sat at Sidi Rezai, waiting for the South Africans to reinforce them. But to the north, the German infantry of Sumerman's division grouped for a dawn attack on the British positions. The first attack was beaten back with ease by the British, since it wasn't covered by artillery. So, Sumerman elected to send in another, but this time they would wait for reinforcements. At first, a battalion of Bologna infantry and a German engineer battalion moved up to Belhamid. But it was the 100mm guns the Germans had rushed up from Bardia that made the biggest impact. They began to shell the British positions in the valley below, scattering the South African armoured cars. The second attack went in at 0800 hours. The German infantry, artillery and anti-tank guns gave the British tanks and South African armoured cars cause for concern. But they held on. It was obvious though to the British commanders that things were heating up, and Brigadier Davy knew that they would need more infantry support if they were to take point 175, which Cunningham had ordered the night before. So, as German shelling continued throughout the day, he had to wait for the arrival of Armstrong's brigade before he could make another move. Meanwhile, Kruvel's two panzer divisions were slowly moving east. He still thought that the British were only aiming to encircle the frontier garrisons, so he and Neumann Silko therefore moved up and down along the Treyeg Capuzo all morning, trying to find British armour which had never actually been there. 
Kampfgruppe Stefan had to wait for the late arrival of a column of fuel and ammunition supplies. Luckily for Stefan, Gatehouse's tank regiments were also delayed, and so Gatehouse failed to concentrate his brigade overnight. Kampfgruppe Stefan was therefore saved from serious trouble during the first tank clash of the day. Stefan first moved across the front of both 8th Hussars and the 5th Royal Tank Regiment. However, von Ravenstein sent an order for Stefan to move northwards to meet with Kampfgruppe Knaber, which was the remainder of 21st Panzer Division. Therefore, Stefan broke off the engagement with the British and began to fall back. This falling back was interpreted by Gatehouse as a retreat against his superior force. So the British pursued for about six miles, then stopped, feeling pretty good about themselves. Kampfgruppe Knabe moved southeast towards the rendezvous area at Gabra Lacan. Once they met up with Kampfgruppe Stefan, they were to move towards Sidi Omar. But by 0830 hours, Knabe reported a strong enemy tank force ahead of him. He called for help from both sides. Consequently, von Ravenstein ordered Stefan to move north as fast as possible. However, Neumann Silko ignored the plea, and he was right to do so, since when Kruvel arrived to inspect the scene, he found that the strong opposition claimed by Knaber was just a few armoured cars from the King's Dragoon Guards. Then, 21st Panzer Division ran out of fuel and was rejoined by Kampfgruppe Stefan. 15th Panzer Division reached City as eyes, and Neumann Silko told Kruvel that there was no British tanks in the area. With a pause in the action, Kruvel decided to analyse his information again. On the 20th of November, German airfields had dried, allowing them to conduct their own reconnaissance and gain much needed information on the position of the enemy forces. With this new information, Kruvel finally concluded that the British must be aiming to relieve Tobruk, and that the British tank forces that were in this area the previous day must be to the south. Kruvel, therefore, had a choice. He could strike the British closest to Tobruk, 7th Armoured Brigade, or hit those that were to the south, protecting the British supply lines. If he did that, he could then head northwest and get behind the British spearhead at Sidi Rezai. He chose the latter plan. He then asked Rommel's permission to advance towards the British at Gabra Salur. But by this point, 21st Panzer Division had run out of fuel, and unless they could get fuel by air, which they couldn't because the Luftwaffe was fully committed now, they wouldn't be able to move until the next day. So, while Rommel agreed with Kruvel's intentions, he said that he should move early on the 21st with both divisions. Kruvel, for the first time, disregarded Rommel's suggestion, and in the afternoon ordered 15th Panzer Division to wheel southwards and move towards Gabra Salur with orders to gain contact. 21st Panzer Division was told to catch up overnight. So, at 1600 hours, 15th Panzer Division began to advance towards 4th Armoured Brigade and its 123 M3 light tanks at Gabra Salur. Cunningham had left Norris HQ and had returned to his own at Medellina. Here, he was greeted with the news that the RAF had seen Axis traffic streaming back westwards in three places. The first place was between Bardia towards Tobruk, the second from El Adam to Akroma, and the third from Tobruk to Gazala. It was suggested that this could be supply columns or Italian administrative troops moving out of the area to leave room for the German armour to operate, but Cunningham thought otherwise. He interpreted these moves to be a general evacuation of Axis troops. This gave him the impression that the enemy might be trying to get away, and that makes sense considering the advance to City Rizai and the first clashes in the battle had been in the British favour. At least, that's what the British thought. Of course, all of this was wrong, as was Cunningham. This reading of events was to influence thought at the top at several crucial moments during the next few days. Meanwhile, at City Rezai, Gott thought that the enemy ahead of him was weak. So, at 10am, he told Norrie that the support group should be able to break through to the 70th Division. 
if Scobie made his sortie on the morning of the next day, the 21st of November. Norrie liked this idea, and put the idea to Cunningham. Even though the enemy's armour had not been defeated first, breaking through to Tobruk was an attractive proposition, and Cunningham contemplated it. Slightly later, at 1100 hours, Norrie signalled the latest intelligence reports. The British had intercepted messages between Kruvel and Rommel. It appeared that Kruvel now understood the situation, and that the two panzer divisions were going to attack 4th Armoured Brigade at noon that day. Here, at last, after two and a half days, was German acceptance of battle at Gabrasala. But instead of relief, the news caused consternation. With Axis armour concentrated and coming for 4th Armoured Brigade, Cunningham now suddenly realised, finally, that his own armour was dispersed over a wide area. There wasn't three armoured brigades grouped together as originally hoped, but one single brigade, and this wouldn't be able to take on the full might of two panzer divisions. Cunningham knew now that it would be a race to concentrate his armour before the Germans arrived, and time was no longer on his side. Cunningham quickly ordered 22nd Armoured Brigade to ignore its previous orders to go to City Rizai, and ordered it to go eastwards to reinforce Gatehouse. Norrie accepted Cunningham's orders and told Gott to disengage 22nd Armoured Brigade from the Arete Division at Bur el Gubi and then move it towards Gabra Saleh. However, Gott reported that 22nd Armoured Brigade would be delayed, as it was still waiting for Pienaar's Brigade to take over, and it would need to refuel and resupply before it could join 4th Armoured Brigade. In the end, only 4th County of London Yeomanry and 3rd Battalion of the Royal Horse Artillery actually arrived to support 4th Armoured Brigade, and these arrived too late to influence the battle. Of course, there were other British formations nearby, not just armoured ones. Ten miles to the southeast of Gabra Saleh was the bulk of Freiburg's 2nd New Zealand Division and 1st Army Tank Brigade attached, but these were part of 13th Corps and so not under 30 Corps command. Godwin Austin, or perhaps John Harding, his staff officer, suggested that they could support 4th Armoured Brigade with the New Zealander infantry, anti-tank guns and their Matilda and Valentine tanks. But Cunningham turned this down. 30 Corps was to take on the Germans alone, because it was the tank force, and infantry shouldn't get involved in a tank battle. It was an example of the rigidity and departmentalism of the British mind. So, Cunningham sat anxious for the next three hours, 1200 to 1500, at his HQ, pondering the situation. He was finally going to get the armoured battle envisioned by the original Crusader plan, but his armour wasn't concentrated. He was still confident of victory though, he just needed to bring his armour together to meet the threat. If he could do this, the British would meet the four German panzer battalions with six British tank battalions, which was a numerical superiority. So yes, he was worried, but he could still win, right? Now, you might be wondering, why didn't Cunningham bring 7th Armoured Brigade or 7th Support Group to Gabra Saleh as well? They were just sat at City Rizai, right? Nope. At about 1600 hours, Cunningham approved Gott's suggestion, which had come from Norrie, that they should break through to Tobruk. He then ordered the 70th Division to make its attack at dawn on the 21st of November. It was also hoped that Armstrong's 5th South African Brigade would reach City of Azai by 7am the following day and assist 7th Support Group. So, even though the tank battle that they had been waiting for was about to begin, the British weren't going to use all their tank forces that they had intended to use in this clash. This was a radical change from the original plan of defeating the enemy's armour first, and it gave the Germans a better chance of beating them. This could be seen as overconfidence by Cunningham, who thought the German panzers were reduced in strength after the action of the day before. Maybe he judged the situation and thought that two brigades would be enough to defeat them at Gabra Saleur. And it was a mistake on Gott's part, who also seems to have forgotten the original Crusader plan. Norrie was influenced by Gott's decisions, since Gott was more experienced in that regard, so he made a mistake as well. Overall though, Cunningham makes the operational decisions, and he should have pulled back as much of his armour as possible to meet the German threat. He does not do this, and therefore probably should take the majority of the blame. 
Kruvel reached Gabra Salur before 22nd Armoured Brigade, and won the race. But in the end, the resulting clash consisted of just one British Brigade against one Panzer Regiment. However, that Panzer Regiment had more tanks than the British. 15th Panzer Division had 38 Panzer IIs, 76 Panzer III's, and 21 Panzer IVs, for a total of 135 tanks. They were going up against around 123 M3 light tanks, but of course, the Germans also had infantry, artillery, anti-tank and anti-aircraft gun support, so they had a significant advantage. At half four in the afternoon, 15th Panzer Division approached 4th Armoured Brigade's positions. The British were sat on a slight rise with the sun behind them and their ammunition racks full, but this didn't dissuade the Germans. Kramer's 8th Panzer Regiment was in the middle, with an infantry battalion on each of the flanks and with artillery support. At first, the British advantage of terrain and sun support, plus the fact that their tanks were in hold down positions, matched the numerical superiority that the Germans had. At this point, it was a more or less equal struggle. Some British medium bombers tried to help the 4th Armoured Brigade in this fight, but couldn't tell who was who in the dust, so the embarrassed pilots had to return to their base with their bombs. After around 30 minutes, the Germans brought up their 88mm guns, which turned the tide of the battle. The 88s picked off the front line of M3s, and German weight in numbers soon drove 4th Armoured Brigade slowly back down the reverse side of the slope. At 18.30 hours, just as the light began to fade, the 1st Crusader tanks of 22nd Armoured Brigade arrived to the west on the German right flank. They were too little too late to get involved in the fight, since Gatehouse had been forced to move south. And, fearing a strong flank attack, Neumann Silko quickly formed an artillery screen to guard against Scott Coburn's brigade. As the night fell, the fighting died, with the Germans, as was their custom, camping on the battlefield and the British, as was theirs, withdrawing from it. The two British brigades withdrew south of the Treig El Abd, with 4th Armoured on the right of 22nd Armoured. Counting their losses, another 26 British tanks were lost or damaged. The Germans didn't record their own losses for the day, but the estimate is about 30 damaged or destroyed. No doubt some of these were then recovered and repaired, but again, it's hard to tell. Reading the reports, Kruvel was delighted that the British armour had been pushed back with considerable losses. The Germans thought that they had beaten the British and put this unit out of action, which would affect their judgement going forwards. The reality was that the British had pulled back across the Treig El Abd to regroup and resupply. And, while they had suffered losses, they now had two armoured brigades together, which still had 97 M3 lights and 100 Crusaders ready for the morning. So, the British command assumed the Germans were defeated the day before, the Germans now assumed the British were defeated today, and the reality was that this battle, just like most of the action so far, had been indecisive. Effectively, both sides had come to the wrong conclusions based on the evidence they had. By last light on the 20th of November, 4th and 22nd Brigades were spread widely across the desert and intermingled with enemy units. Refueling and rearming was difficult and confusing. A concerned Cunningham waited for news about the fight between 4th Armoured Brigade and the Africa Corps. He needed to know if his right flank was secure or not, and if the Panzers had broken through, which would threaten Godwin Austin's force. His spirits lifted when the news arrived that not only had 4th Armoured Brigade survived and withdrawn with 22nd Armoured Brigade, but that the Panzer divisions were withdrawing to the north. Cunningham believed that Gatehouse had won the decisive battle and that things were going his way. He therefore ordered both the 4th and 22nd Armoured Brigades to attack the fleeing German armour on the next day. In addition, Cunningham had already ordered Scobie's 70th Division to attack towards El Dudda at dawn on the 21st of November, where it would meet up with the 7th Support Group, who would drive to the northwest, supported by Armstrong's 5th South African Infantry Brigade. This was assuming it actually arrived on time. Pienaar's 1st South African Brigade would continue to screen the Irete Division near Bur El Gubi. 
Gott therefore gave orders at 8pm for his operations the next day. Norrie had given the code word POP to signal the Tobruk breakout attempt, which was due to start the next morning at dawn. But Gott, the guy at the front, had no communication with Tobruk, where Scobie was preparing to launch a well-rehearsed plan for capturing several locations between the southeast corner of the perimeter and El Dudda. Gott therefore couldn't coordinate his efforts with Scobie, which would lead to problems over the next few days. Gott wanted to secure the captured airfield and move towards El Dudda. The support group at Sidi Rezai would attack north to meet the infantry tanks of 32nd Army Tank Brigade, who would also head to El Dudda to meet them. Meanwhile, Davies 7th Armoured Brigade would attack west from Sidi Rezai to Abiyar El Amar and reach the ridge overlooking the Treyik Capuzo. This was all assuming the South Africans arrived though. Unfortunately, Armstrong's 5th South African Infantry Brigade only started to move towards Sidi Rezai just before 5pm. It then had to halt at dusk with Gott's approval because Brink didn't think his troops had enough experience to move at night. So there were delays already and day 4 hadn't even begun yet. That evening, Kruvel was helped in his quest to persuade Rommel on just how important the British attack was. The British BBC News Broadcast Centre in Cairo decided, in its ultimate wisdom, to announce to the world that the 8th Army, with 75,000 men, which was incorrect, had launched a new attack, invaded Libya, and were going to destroy Axis forces before taking the whole of North Africa. And people say the BBC is a Nazi. Hearing all this, Rommel realised that the British attack must be a real attack, and so quickly postponed the assault on Tobruk. It now suddenly looked as though he was facing a large British force intent on dealing a decisive blow to his forces, not just the distraction it had appeared to have been earlier. Better late than never, eh Rommel? More reports came in about a group to the south, the Oasis Group, with a vast train of 500 or 600 British vehicles heading towards the coast near Benghazi. This threatened to cut off Axis supply routes, which would be pretty bad. But it appears that Rommel dismissed this secondary British attack, which he did think was quite strong, and decided to concentrate his force on one problem at a time. As Pitt points out, the Oasis force had achieved the opposite of what it had intended to do. Instead of dispersing Rommel's forces, it had concentrated them. But the main British attack towards Tobruk presented a problem to Rommel. The big issue was one of supply. Rommel knew that if the British weren't defeated quickly, he wouldn't have the resources to keep fighting them. So in his mind, he had to engage them in a short, sharp fight, and he had to win it decisively. Rommel was, therefore, intent on hunting the British armour down and destroying them. The exact thing the British had hoped he'd do on day one, and it was now the end of day three. Their forces were spread out and weakened after three days of movement and fighting, and decisive General Rommel was about to strike. Clearly not good for the British. However, while Rommel was aiming to destroy the British forces, he was also determined to hold onto the frontier positions and maintain the siege of Tobruk. Even now, he stubbornly refused to acknowledge that this attack on Tobruk was defunct. This meant that most of his forces would be stuck in defensive positions, and therefore he could only really use his panzer divisions to defeat the British and possibly the mobile Italian units from Gambara's corps, which weren't under his control at this moment in time. Clearly not ideal, but this was a larger force than he had had when he defeated the British 2nd Armoured Division during his first desert offensive earlier in the year. So it's not unreasonable to assume that this force, which was twice as large as he had had back then, could take on the 7th Armoured Division and co now. Believing that 4th Armoured Brigade had already been defeated and was out for the count, as was reported, Rommel allowed Kruvel to move the two panzer divisions from Gabra Saler towards Sidi Rezai to destroy the British force there on the next day. Rommel also urged him to start this move as early as possible. This resulted in von Ravenstein's now refueled division moving to catch up as early as 0300 hours. 
So yes, the British finally had Rommel's attention, but clearly he wasn't playing the game that they wanted him to play. Rommel was now on the hunt to destroy the British armoured forces, and its two elite panzer divisions were heading straight towards Davies 7th Armoured Brigade and Campbell's 7th Support Group at Sidi Rizai. This was going to be a good hunt that we will see next episode. <laughs> and I'm going to make you very aware that what we will see next episode is something that can only be described as unique in the annals of military history. And that's not an exaggeration. I don't know of any other battle where something like this happens. The official British history on this battle just stops and says, wait, 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 we're going to just take a moment here to appreciate what we're seeing because this is unbelievable. And that's the official British history. That's pretty much what Playfair says. So, the armoured battle the British have been waiting for begins. The situation is absolutely insane, and those dominoes keep on falling. But I don't want to spoil it for you, so I'm not going to say any more. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.